All right, I would say let's let's start in order not to to lose too much time. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. It's uh, I'm glad to welcome you all today for our Reboot Aviation webinar. Uh, my name is Jan Willem. I'm the director of business development for Asaya. Um, today's webinar is about beyond COVID, the new airport experience that we will be facing. Uh, with me today are um, Rene Hopstarken from NACO, Bob Quick from Illinium, as well as uh, Doug Kreutzkamp from Springshot. They will later on also introduce themselves. Um, the agenda for today, uh, we will, whoop, Piotr. The agenda for today is we will start a brief introduction. Um, then uh, Rene uh, from NACO will give his views on what will be the future, uh, followed by Bob from Illinium, and last but definitely not least, um, Doug from Springshot. There will be questions and answers afterwards. Um, maybe a little bit for the uh, housekeeping. There is a question and answer button on the bottom of your screen, so you can ask questions already during the webinar. Um, and there will also be a little poll towards the end of the webinar where we ask for your feedback. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so the recording will later on be made available to you so that if you have something that you want to revisit again, you can do so. Next slide, please. Now, what is the, if we look at the bigger picture, where can we put the, the topic of today into? Um, definitely everything inside the terminal building, land side and air side. Uh, so we are looking into check-in, into um, also kind of shopping and security. Um, and then also later on up to the, the, the boarding um, bit but also uh, what kind of facilities within an airport um, can be worked on differently, especially Doug will, will have some very interesting insights into this area. And with this, Piotr, without any further ado, I would like to hand over the word to Rene. Piotr, can you go back please? Yes. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the introduction, uh, Jan Willem. Uh, my name is René Hopstaken. I'm project manager and consultant uh, at NACO, uh, at the Special Airport Systems uh, Department. And uh, I'm uh, particularly uh, occupied with, with uh, future technologies. Um, in today's webinar, I want to uh, uh, continue on, on last month's webinar that my colleague uh, Anna Fantoni, uh, she discussed the, the, the startup of, um, of uh, aviation uh, after the, uh, the COVID crisis. And in this session, I would like to uh, have a look beyond uh, the crisis. So um, there are, even though we have the, the second wave in Europe, for uh, for infections, uh, there are some some lights on the horizon, some some positive news. Uh, for example, uh, speed testing uh, we see that are being applied at airports, uh, COVID speed testing, and also um, the um, uh, vaccinations uh, that are coming in China in the middle of this month, and also uh, by the end of the month uh, for mostly the rest of the world. Um, so that's uh, so in, the, in this session, we're going to look beyond this time. Eh? So when, when, when things are stabilizing. Um, next slide, please. So before we go to look into the future, uh, I'd like to, uh, to take a step back and uh, have a look at how the aviation industry developed. Uh, in the past, there have been several conditions around airports that have uh, led to the developments and the shape of airports as we have them now. If you look at the left top, you see, for example, one of the first um, uh, passenger boarding bridges, which has led to a elevation of the, uh, the passengers uh, level of an airport and um, of the, the ground service uh, equipment and services have uh, stayed on at grade, for example. 
If you look at the left bottom, you see a security checkpoint that was introduced after uh, in the 60s. There were about 60 events around the globe uh, where uh, hijackings took place in, in, in planes. Uh, so it was to avoid uh, people from carrying weapons uh, aboard. On the right top, you see a dedicated uh, checking counter, for example, um, uh, at LEX Olympic, uh, Los Angeles Olympic Games in 1984 that led to a huge uh, chaos at LEX. Um, and this had led to the development of common use uh, uh, check-in facilities. And on the right bottom, you see um, uh, the, the typical baggage label that we know. Th this is a result of, a, uh, of um, uh, the, the fact that in the, in the 80s, there were events where, a, uh, where bombs were carried on board in, in uh, uh, belly luggage. Uh, so the requirement to, to um, uh, get passengers uh, back, uh, back as reconciliation uh, with, with, with the passenger. Uh, led to the need for this kind of uh, labels. And this led to the development of, uh, of course, the highly sophisticated uh, baggage systems that we see now at airports. Next slide, please. So here you see an image of, of a typical layout of an airport. Uh, you could say the typical airport DNA, um, uh, where all the different processing facilities uh, are indicated. You see the the check-in facilities and the security uh, checkpoint uh, that you see on every airport and, and also the, the baggage handling system that very often uh, on, a, on a level below uh, the passenger's uh, level. Um, so this arrangement is kind of a typical DNA of an airport and you see that there are many proce processes um, in this layout. Um, and this was the situation uh, uh, before COVID. Uh, airports were very crowded, there was lots of queues and, and there were also a lot of developments uh, all around the globe. Initiatives, for example, um, uh, IATA Next initiative, all kinds of uh, initiatives to, to develop new technologies um, uh, to, to cope with, with the capacity issues that you had at, uh, at the airport at this moment. And next slide, please. Um, and then the, the COVID uh, crisis started, and um, there was even there were the, there was a sudden drop in the in the passenger demand. The traffic uh, was almost gone, uh, but at the same time, for those people who were flying, there were there were all kinds of regulation uh, 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 defined by different governments and different regulations uh, depending on the destination you were traveling to. And uh, well, these regulations sometimes also even change over time, uh, where at first you have only to fill in a immunity declaration. The next day you have to, uh, to do uh, uh, COVID testing or something like that. Uh, um, so is this a situation where uh, the DNA, the typical DNA of, uh, uh, of an airport uh, might change? Uh, we have heard uh, from, from uh, at the ACI meeting, an uh, ACI session last week, for example, where the expert said that probably uh, the, the measures that are required for, uh, for health uh, issues like COVID will remain in the future. Airports will have to be prepared uh, to, 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 to cope with these types of crises. So uh, this would be another uh, step in the entire passenger process. Um, so is this a, is this, are these the conditions for, uh, for a new development of, uh, of the airport DNA? Next slide, please. Um, so um, um, last summer, uh, NACO has done a, a, a survey towards the return to operations with several airports around the globe. And uh, from that, uh, from those, uh, from this uh, survey, there were certain uh, concerns about the airports. Um, one of them, as mentioned before, is the travel restrictions and the need for operational flexibility. Uh, on the short term, uh, this is resolved by putting stickers on, on boarding cards or things like that. Uh, 
a medium term solution could be uh, uh, an application on a mobile phone. Uh, we have, for example, the, the, the common pass uh, uh, project is, is, for example, a, a, a solution that's being trialed now uh, between uh, London and New York, um, where you could do this, this uh, uh, registration uh, on your mobile phone and you don't need to have all these uh, stickers, for example. On the longer term, um, this could develop into uh, a self-sovereign uh, identity management uh, system. Um, airports are also concerned about the, the social distancing and in particular when, when aviation will uh, start up again. And, uh, at this moment with, with very low traffic, it's not a big issue, but uh, in the future when, when, when traffic will pick up again, uh, this might be a, a bigger issue. So crowd management and off airport processing uh, will be uh, something uh, for the midterm. And on the longer time, it could even evolve into more space gains uh, with the use of more technology. Um, then the health requirements. Uh, airports, of course, are very concerned uh, about the cleanliness and the health uh, situation at airports. Uh, there are many uh, requirements. One of them is the, 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 to reduce touch points and the touchless passenger process. Um, on the short term, you could think of uh, taking over a, uh, uh, the, the, the kiosk uh, screen uh, on your mobile phone. But for the, for the medium term, you, you can think of more touchless uh, passenger processing solutions. And in the longer term, uh, also the introduction of biometric processing. And then last but not least, um, of course, all the concerns above are not only from the airports, but also for the, the passengers and the passengers, they, uh, they um, uh, are reluctant to travel. Um, so there is a huge loss of, of, uh, of income and also revenues from, from uh, commercial uh, facilities. Uh, for a midterm solution, the introduction of e-commerce platforms could be, uh, could be uh, a, a solution. And for the longer term, uh, land and airside revenue generation. Um, um, next slide, please. So for um, the longer term and the, for the midterm and the longer term, there are some, some uh, suites of technological solutions that can be centered around two topics. And the first one is around the, the check-in uh, process. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so we can redesign or redefine the check-in of, of aviation. Uh, one of the solutions is um, you can have the health uh, declaration and registration at home, as I mentioned already with, with the common pass uh, solution, for example. But at home, you can also do your, your uh, check-in for boarding, but also, for example, your uh, passport scan uh, could be done there. And even your, your baggage labeling, if you uh, have uh, electronic bag tags. Next slide, please. Um, uh, then another step that's part of this suite of solutions is, for example, uh, remote baggage pickup. And that would keep baggage out of the check-in area. But also when you enter the, the airport, uh, for example, uh, at the moment where you arrive with the, with the railway, uh, with the rail, or if you park your car at the long-term parking, if you could drop off your bag there, you don't need to take it into the check-in area, uh, which will make your, the procedures inside check-in uh, in, in, in the departures hall much shorter. Um, Next slide, please. And then inside, of course, you also, you, at first you will have a, a backup uh, uh, process required for people who opt out of, uh, of uh, this uh, system. But then you could provide them with, with touchless uh, check-in kiosks and, for example, use two-step check-in, which uh, facilitates uh, self-processing of passengers. Next slide, please. And then because with this package, you kind of driving the passengers towards the use of their mobile phone, this also opens up possibilities for uh, uh, e-commerce platforms through the mobile phone. And you can think of uh, all kinds of services, for example, 
uh, combined sales of a train ticket with a plane ticket, um, long-term parking in combination with a, with a plane ticket, and for example, the uh, luxury take-in of your luggage. Um, but you can also think of um, uh, making reservations at restaurants on air sites, uh, booking your slot uh, to enter uh, uh, through security, uh, or delivery uh, at the gate uh, of your uh, duty-free goods. Um, next slide, please. Then another um, um, development option that you could have, maybe more for the longer term, is um, around the biometric technology. Uh, you could develop the airport further to a single biometric checkpoint. Um, at this moment, NACO is conducting a research um, for ACRP. Um, uh, in the US um, and uh, on biometric technologies. Um, we would be very interesting to, to get your feedback uh, in this session or questions uh, regarding this issue. Um, uh, we believe there's a lot of potential uh, to use it uh, at airports. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for example, with your self-sovereign ID, uh, you could also use your biometrics in there. And the idea from, from self-sovereign ID is that you own your own data and you can share the data for your trip um, and all the data that is required for your trip uh, with the parties uh, that need it. So you're in control and you, for example, can send your health uh, data uh, to the stakeholder that, uh, that needs to check that. Uh, next slide, please. And then with the use of biometrics, um, you, have, uh, you have the opportunity to, to win, uh, to gain a lot of uh, space. For example, by uh, combining the passport control and security checkpoints, uh, the checks are actually being done already at home when you enroll. Uh, so you already know that you can pass every step, every step. So that's why you could combine it, for example. Uh, and also what you see here is that we, uh, that we, can, we foresee a common departure lounge. You, you don't need to have domestic and international separated uh, uh, if you use biometrics. If you check at, uh, at boarding uh, one more time, you're sure that the right person is boarding. Um, so that's also a, a big advantage. Next slide, please. And then with all, the, with all the square meters that you can gain, of course, you can, you can develop all kinds of uh, uh, different services that you, uh, that you can provide on air side, but also on land side. Uh, you can also think of, of um, uh, um, developing, if you develop your land side areas also very well uh, and think of airport city, uh, then your business could even continue also when you have a crisis uh, like uh, the COVID crisis. So at the end, if you see that we have only one uh, biometric checkpoint, then compared with the, the layout that we started with, uh, we believe this is a, this is a great step uh, for uh, passengers and the passenger experience. If you imagine that you can, can uh, prepare everything at home, uh, you can go to the airport, drop your bag, and have only one more checkpoint uh, to pass. Uh, which will have very few queues, but because the processing speed is so, so high, uh, it's a very ideal uh, image uh, of the future. Um, of course, this is a nice image. Um, in order to get there, it will cost a lot of money and a lot of investments. Um, uh, we are very aware that at this moment, uh, airlines and airports, they have uh, very little money to spend. And any money they want to spend is, of course, on uh, enabling flying again. Uh, the only message we would like to give to those, uh, to those parties is that uh, any development or any choice that you made, any decision that you make in uh, uh, investing your money, make it uh, in such a way that you enable uh, the, the, the future outlook that you, uh, that you are foreseeing. Um, well, that was uh, all for my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. Um, quite some interesting points, and you also spurred already some interest from the <laughs> from the floor. Uh, some some months ago, I attended a or a IATA meeting, and there we talked about the uh, dark apron 
no more people like service people on the apron. And that goes a little bit into the dark uh, terminal where, where there are no more service people around in the terminal. So let's see where this is going. Thanks a lot. Next one in the line is Bob Quick from Illenium. Bob, floor is yours. Thanks, John William. And uh, thanks, Renee. Yeah, my name is Bob Quick. I'm uh, based in Dublin in Ireland, and I look after Illenium's business for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, Illenium, uh, their core business, I guess, is self-service passenger automation in airports, so kiosk, bag drop, e-gates, and all of the hardware and software that support that. And uh, recently, we've moved into health screening technology, and I'll, I'll touch on that very, uh, very briefly. Um, so just on the next slide, you know, looking at, uh, at where we are with the pandemic, uh, I guess it's important to note we are still, still in the middle of it and, uh, and Europe and, and the US are, are uh, suffering with the current wave. Uh, congratulations, I guess, to the Australians for, for coming out of it. But we're still looking at uh, the latest numbers I had. It's, it's, uh, I looked it up, it's 1.17 million deaths uh, from COVID, which is uh, obviously a, a staggering loss of life. Um, looking at the, the image here, you can see uh, the Spanish flu uh, sort of towards the back of it, um, you know, 40 to 50 million deaths, and it was about 100 years ago, so there's a lot of references between the Spanish flu uh, situation and COVID now. But it's interesting to see the, the various pandemics between now and then. Uh, obviously, AIDS is, is uh, enormous in, in that picture, um, and you've got uh, the Asian and Hong Kong flu in the, uh, the early part, part of last century. What I think is most interesting is in the last 25 years, the number of pandemics that we've seen, uh, SARS, the swine flu, MERS, Ebola, also the West Nile virus. Um, and, and unfortunately, as, as uh, Rene was saying, it, it, uh, this isn't going away. And the, the view of the, the medical and aviation industry is that we need to be prepared uh, continuously for, um, for dealing with this pandemic, but also dealing with the next pandemic. So I guess on the, uh, the downside of, of the post-COVID world is, you know, just like 9-11 changed security, uh, COVID will change the, uh, the pandemic threat uh, for the, the airport journey. And it is something that we'll have to, to include in the airport process uh, going forward. I guess on a more positive note, you know, a lot of the, the nice trends and the cool trends that we've seen are also forecasted to continue. So in addition to expecting um, improved health screening at airports, uh, we'd also expect to get a uh, better touch experience and, and really the view there is that we shouldn't have to touch anything uh, in the airport journey as we go through the, um, the, the get arriving at the airport and boarding the aircraft. Uh, self-service is, is a huge trend in the industry but still lots of, of room to, to implement more self-service and already we're seeing airports moving towards uh, things like automated backdrop to remove the need to have staff or as many staff in the airport to accommodate the, the ups and downs in the traffic and also to implement a touchless experience. Um, mobile phone is an important part of that touchless journey, whether it's operating completely on your mobile phone or you use your mobile phone as part of the, the self-service experience. And you know, I think we all know there are still lots and lots of opportunities for digitization in the airport journey. And I'll touch on that uh, a little more soon uh, in, in, uh, shortly, but I'm sure we've all seen uh, so many opportunities for us to, to make the journey easier using some digital technology. On the next slide, um, we at Inium are, are fortunate to have um, business outside of the air transport and we've implemented some of our, our technologies there. And one of the issues we have in the aviation uh, business is passenger volumes are so low, it's really difficult to see what the experience is like using these new technologies. Uh, so we're just looking outside of aviation, we have a, a project uh, or an implementation at a Meatworks facility in, uh, in Australia. And that's where we have lots of people going to work and uh, using this new self-service technology. So it's interesting to see what, what are those experiences like and what lessons can we take from, uh, from outside the air transport industry and apply those to what the world will be like, uh, hopefully uh, post COVID in, uh, in aviation. So firstly, the, the touchless experience, um, again, implementing it en masse has, has been very positive. We, we use head movement detection to do touchless technology and, uh, and people find it very intuitive. Once they've used it um, just briefly, it becomes a natural way to interact with the self-service device. And also the notion of screening people's health. Um, it can be a, contra a controversial concept. Do you want to check people's health? 
and the feedback from the the employees was was very positive they liked the feeling of the technology scanning them they thought it was cool but they also liked the the assurance of going to work and knowing that they they were safe but also knowing that all of their colleagues and people they're working with don't have any uh, any illnesses the other interesting element with all this talk about touchless and uh, and mobile phones is we gave uh, the, um, the employees a choice between using the touchless technology or using their mobile phone to answer some screening questions. That's interesting. The majority certainly prefer to use their mobile phone beforehand. Um, but over a, a period of time, there was still a significant minority who preferred not to use their phone. So about 40% still wanted to use the touchless technology and given the choice, preferred not to use their mobile phone. Uh, which is, I think, an uh, interesting learning for us in the, uh, in the aviation industry. I've got a short video on the next slide, uh, if you can uh, play that. Um, there's no, well, there is audio. The audio is a bird singing. But you can see here the person using the touches technology and the yellow cursor uh, is corresponding to the head movement. Here they're just checking the person's health. And again, you can see it's, it's within seconds that the health is screened. But the interesting bit is how they uh, use the head movement detection for interacting with the self-service device. Again, the yellow arrow is, corresponds to the cursor, so as they move the head, the cursor moves, and then when you hover, it, uh, it registers as a click. You can see that they read the question and then answer yes or no, and there's no touching at all of the device, and it's a, it's a quick process. The next frame, uh, you can see they're doing the exact same thing, but this time it's with the mobile phone. Same questions answered, uh, again, touching the phone instead of the uh, self-service device. It's, it's slightly faster, but not, uh, not significantly so. And again, it produces a 2D barcode. And that's a really simple way of interacting and doing a handover between the mobile phone and the, uh, the self-service device. Again, quick health check and, uh, and the person's on the way. So looking beyond, uh, beyond the, the, uh, the technology and back into to aviation, you know, we see that the, the check-in experience will, will really become no more. Uh, when's the last time we went to an airport and bought a ticket for a flight? I mean, we wouldn't dream of going to an airport and buying a, a ticket for a flight. We would always buy it at home or, or in the office. And the same with check-in. Uh, already, the, the majority of us will check in online, and that will just become normal. So we go to the airport, and the experience will be your screening. So you drop off your bag, the bag gets screened, and you, you go through some kind of screening process for health and for, for security. Again, as 9-11 changed security, COVID is changing screening. So we will have this health screening as part of the process. As Rene said, biometrics will underpin all of this and, and streamline the journey. And we'll also have a, the touchless will be an, an uh, ever present part of this. But also these processes will get more intelligent. The bag drop process already, airlines are, are quite dynamic in changing their pricing. As some airlines are currently talking about pushing all baggage to be checked in. So the screening is, is more touchless, but that will eventually change. So you need to have that dynamic um, way of dealing with, uh, with bag drop. And similarly, we need you know, near real-time intelligence on the risk of, of uh, pandemics as we do our screening. So we can adjust and adapt how, how rigorously we, we do the screening and what degree of testing we do based on known risks. Uh, and again, using that with, uh, with artificial intelligence and real-time information. So on the next slide, we, uh, we look now at the, the airside experience and, and really the whole airport experience is going to move to airside. The, uh, the, the screening experience will, will bring us into a, a much richer uh, airside experience. Um, so when passengers go to uh, arrive at the airport, it's interesting, only 60% of passengers have a boarding pass for their entire flight so far. Um, and additionally, only 60% only know who to contact if something goes wrong during the journey. So again, it's ripe there for a level of automation once you go airside. And the same with disruptions, you know, pre-COVID, 50% of passengers have had uh, issues with uh, disruption in the last 12 months, which I don't think would surprise anyone. And again, when you're, when you're airside and you're waiting for your, waiting for your flight, about 30% of people want to be able to buy last minute um, purchases such as seat upgrades or, or lounge access and so on. And really there's, there's very limited experience so the, the airside experience is ripe for disruption and ripe for, for digital disruption and ripe for, for improvement with automation. And so the first thing we need to do is better automate disruptions using self-service technology and better mobile phone applications. Um, airport transfers are, are usually a hassle. It's the number one thing people, uh, passengers complain about. 
So we need to figure out how to improve the, the airport transfer experience again with self-service and, uh, and automation. And retail shopping, while many airports have you know, beautiful shopping areas that, that feel like a, a luxury shopping mall, there really is a very limited amount of um, digital disruption in, uh, in the retail shopping experience. So just on the, uh, on the next slide, Peter. Um, there's a lot of technologies now that are becoming more, more pervasive and more easily available to improve the passengers' experience in the airport. And, and not incidentally to also improve the, the revenues for airports and airlines. So you saw the handover between the, the mobile phone using a 2D barcode um, with the self-service device earlier. The exact same technology works for doing a payment with your mobile phone. And it really allows a whole variety of self-service devices to become payment devices without the expense of the chip and pin unit. Similarly, you know, if you go to a gate at, uh, at almost every airport, there's no way for an agent at the gate to take a credit card payment because that multi-merchant payment infrastructure isn't in place. Again, if you want to do a last minute seat upgrade, uh, a last minute change to, to business or first class, you can't do it or pay for it at the gate. Similarly, there's been trials taking place and I've got a video on the next slide of, of a proof of concept of, well, if you, if you just want, don't mind going back, Peter, we'll, I'll do the video in a second. Um, the, there's an opportunity for virtual retail. So whether, whether that is augmenting additional retail, so you go to, to an electronic store in the airport, they don't have what you want, but you can still buy it and get it shipped to your home or your hotel. Or some airports are trialing using virtual shopping areas in maybe constrained areas or, or sort of piers, maybe at the gate. So you're at the gate, then you decide to buy duty-free. Rather than walking all the way back, you can go to the, to the virtual retail. And using this now ever present uh, biometrics that we will, we will eventually get, there's a significant opportunity to, to pay with your face. So that allows hybrid retail. It allows you, for example, to do in-flight shopping before you fly. Um, so you can browse the, the electronic catalog for your airline and do the purchases. You get the goods on board or potentially when you, when you, when you arrive. A lot of opportunity for last minute seat upgrades. And I always say to, to airlines, you know, last minute seat upgrades is free money for the airlines. Um, so if you want to, to move to an exit row, change your seat, move into business class, no one's going to do it um, when they're on board. So this is the ideal time to get that last minute revenue. And then you're sitting at the gate and you're thinking, oh, when I arrive, I'm going to have to get a taxi. I'm going to have to get to my hotel. What entertainment is there? Should I book a dinner uh, reservation, et cetera? So there's a lot of opportunities for those kind of commercial um, uh, retail as well. So just on the next slide, uh, thanks, Peter. Hopefully the audio will work and you can see the, uh, you might need to click on play. I'm going to make my way through the duty free and purchase something. Hello, Mr. Hornliner. Welcome to Duty Free. Please tell me or tap on the item you would like to purchase. I'd like the notebook and pen, please. Okay, great. You selected the notebook and pen. Would you like it delivered to your home or hotel? To my hotel, please. We are sending your Duty Free purchase to your hotel. We have your payment details and have charged your Visa credit card ending 5478. A purchase summary will appear on your app. So there you see just a simple illustration of, uh, of how biometrics and virtual shopping can be integrated. And this, of course, can be positioned anywhere in the airport. It's better experience for the passenger and also retail opportunities for, uh, for the airport or the airline. So just on the last slide, uh, Peter. So I, I love this quote, uh, COVID will accelerate history rather than reshape it. And that's really what we're seeing. And I think it's one of the trends we're seeing in this, in this webinar is you know, the, the trends that existed earlier. And, and in fact, even the technology to check people's health, Alini was already doing that with Etihad. And the use case that they had was uh, sick people on a flight. Uh, it's very expensive if someone gets sick on an aircraft to deal with that process. So already these trends of these technologies were, were already in place. I think COVID is driving the, uh, the acceleration of, uh, of these technologies. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Nice insights. And yeah, that, that quote is, is very, very powerful, <laughs> to say the least. All right, then let's move on to our uh, last person for today. Doug, floor is yours. Cool. Thank you, uh, Jan Willem, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. 
I'm Doug Cruz Camp. I'm based in San Francisco, and I'm the founder and CEO of Springshot. Um, while Renee and Bob have highlighted changes to airport infrastructure and uh, the passenger experience, I wanted to share a few insights on changes that we see occurring to airport operations, in particular, the way that we manage airport cleaning. Um, as Bob just shared, this is really an acceleration moment for cleaning. Um, three trends have emerged over the last decade that, uh, that really transform static cleaning operations into a, a more dynamic and collaborative ecosystem. But it's been COVID-19 that's really accelerated these trends in airports and really making it in the future where airports will no longer have a choice. Um, it's, it's a more productive way to manage operations and it will just be the norm. Uh, but Pieter, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, kind of like Renee, uh, before we jump to the future, let's look at the present and very similar to Renee, including let's look in the past. And so at the far right has really been the state of cleaning operations for uh, probably the last century. I'm sure you're all familiar with this sort of sheet. You'll see this on the back of the door uh, when you exit the restroom. Uh, this is a simple signature sheet. And forever, that's the way janitorial operations have been managed. Um, we've got three different types of workflows, and, and I hesitate to, to use the word workflow, but three types of workflows that janitorial operators have, have deployed you know, over the last few decades. Um, the first of those is what we call the potted plant. And that's literally, let's have a janitor stationed in a room and let's tell them to stay there all day, um, just cleaning that room over and over again. Uh, and there's some airport restrooms where you, you, you will see that today. It's very inefficient, uh, but that's one approach. The second is the clockwork, which is on the hour, every hour, just make the rounds. It doesn't matter if something is dirty, if it's clean, the expectation is perform a task. And, and the last one, unfortunately, is, is the way that a lot of janitorial operations um, actually work today in airports, and it's the scramble approach. Uh, there's very little oversight, and janitors know if they see something that's dirty, go clean it but it's very much scattershot um, and, and there's very little management. So why is that the case? Uh, if we turn to the next slide, um, just to bring it back to where we're at today, you know, there, there's all the talk of robotics, um, you know, moving into janitorial. Certainly there are aspects of it where we've moved into more of robots um, performing the cleaning tasks, but let's face it around the world in airports and in most facilities, cleaning remains a particularly human endeavor. And if we look at the humans and, and the operations and, and how we've gotten to today, unfortunately, um, based on a number of factors with outsourcing uh, being one of the primary ones, over the last few decades, the cleaners are put out into the field in the operation. They have little training. You know, a, a cleaner uh, in, in, a, a, in an airport in the Americas may have an hour or two of training on cleaning. Um, there's this weird expectation that all cleaning um, is very subjective. There's this weird expectation that someone just knows how to clean. And so with very little training, we throw someone into the operation. As you can see, this gentleman here, there's often very little direction. Um, people are just told, do this, um, follow one of those workflows that I shared earlier. And then there's very little feedback. Um, and when you combine that with the mental stress on a human janitor of working in isolation, it's weird because you're in an environment with lots of people, but you as a team member are working by yourself throughout the day and combine that with the fact that it's a physically um, difficult job to do. There are a lot of injuries physically, not to mention the mental um, side of things. It's a very difficult job. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see the results of that, sadly. Um, and that's expectations unmet. So expectations from a passenger experience side of you know, restrooms or terminals not cleaned up to um, the matter that they would expect. And then certainly from the, the airport operator side, of productivity, um, of wasted manpower, of people um, percep in perception just standing around not, not getting the work done. And unfortunately, this is what happens. So uh, as Bob mentioned, as we go to the next slide, the, this COVID-19 is really an acceleration. And so I'll touch on in a second three trends, you can see them here, that have really developed uh, over, over the last decade. Um, they've been there but it's, uh, there's not been this catalyst moment to really drive these into airports. Uh, but, but we believe you're gonna see that. We're seeing pieces of it today. There are airports now really focused on digitizing their cleaning operations, putting RFAs out uh, to, to see what they can do in this space. And the reason is to the right, that obviously anecdotally and the data suggests it, 
the pastors expect things to be clean. Um, and beyond clean, that cleanliness has this connotation of safety. And so if airports are not doing their best to keep facilities clean, obviously pastors are not going to fly. They're not going to get back on aircraft. And so from our vantage point, we believe it's this moment that's finally going to drive these three trends through airport cleaning. Um, and so I'll, we'll go to the next slide. I'll touch on the first one. First one we wanted to highlight is the ubiquity of cleaning enabled sensors and IoT. Outside maybe Japan and South Korea, until recently technology inside restrooms and terminal operations had changed very little in decades. Um, sensors and the advent of, of IoT has really changed that. Now there are hundreds of sensors and smart fixtures on the market that can be used to move cleaning into the digital realm. Uh, these IoT devices are designed to collect data on a specific topic and then share that data through the cloud via either Wi-Fi or through smartphones enabled with Bluetooth low energy. Now on this slide, I've highlighted a handful of these sensor types to provide just a flavor of what's possible. And so when used in concert, these devices help identify dynamically, so dynamically when cleaning must be performed, moving us away from those static workflows. So from left to right, just to go through these different types of sensors, at the far left, we have a passenger flow and, and heat map sensor, uh, like this one that's manufactured by Zovis. These sensors can be programmed to share when the number of passengers who have flowed through an area have reached a certain threshold or when a certain event has occurred. So given cleaning is often based on humic traffic through an area, they can be used to alert janitors to take action when a certain passenger input threshold has been met. Next to the right, we have customer sentiment terminals, like this one manufactured by Happy or Not. These devices allow airports to identify real-time passenger sentiment. You often see them positioned outside restrooms and they serve two purposes. Uh, first, they could be used to, di to dynamically trigger workflows, just uh, very similar to the passenger flow sensor. Or even more importantly, in the cleaning realm, they can identify whether the cleaning program that's been implemented, implemented by the airport is beating the passenger's expectations. So to put meat on that bone, uh, for an example, should the restroom be cleaned after every 150 passengers that fl flow through the space? Or should we tweak the program so that the restroom is clean after every 125 passengers that flow through the restroom? Or, uh, no offense to the gentleman on the call, but maybe it matters if it's a men's room or a women's room, right? What the throughput should be to drive that. And so when you think about the 360 degree, degree review of that, that terminal, it's informing us so that we can build programs, cleaning programs that objectively meet the expectations of the pasture. And then finally to the right, we'll group these two together uh, these are smart fixtures, uh, like the Colo paper towel and soap dispensers you'll see here manufactured by Georgia Pacific, and automatic trash compactors, like this one manufactured by Harmony. These smart devices identify when a specific action must be taken. For example, when the paper towels or soap dispenser uh, needs to be replenished, or when the trash needs to be emptied. So in summary, these sensors allow airports to move away from that potted plant, right? and clockwork type janitorial workflows I mentioned earlier towards a more dynamic targeted and efficient approach that meets actual cleaning demand. The second trend that I wanted to highlight on the next slide is the emergence of sophisticated collaboration platforms that empower and direct janitorial staff. And while sensors and IoT are central um, to, this, to uh, the movement, they're only one part of the equation. Around the world, most cleaning tasks, again, continue to be performed by human beings. And these human beings, they need to be directed as to one to complete cleaning tasks. What type of tasks, where, and for what duration? Uh, to move away from the static workflows, you know, pen and paper obviously is no longer an effective management tool. So janitors, they need to be connected digitally to sensors via smartly designed mobile apps and in a holistic way that packages tasks. For example, uh, janitors should not be directed randomly to move from concourse, say, one minute because a sensor says, hey, I need the paper towels uh, replenished over all the way over to concourse Z two minutes later because there's a spill. There needs to be a platform in the middle that intelligently processes all these inputs from all these different sensors to figure out what's the way to the best package this work. And then based on the geographic positioning of janitors, based on the certain qualifications, based on their work availability, 
that platform can then intelligently distribute that work so that cleaning can be done uh, both meeting expectations and in the most productive way possible. Uh, finally, uh, the, the last trend that we wanted to touch on, and this really is a critical piece, is uh, the hybrid integration platform approach, or you could just say the, the ubiquity of APIs. These have really changed in the software world uh, over the last 10 years, and that things have opened up. And so through an integrated uh, approach, you can really look at uh, incorporating best practices from a sensor standpoint. And so you could look at a specific use case and say, I'm most focused on the gate hold area and I wanna make sure that I, I don't have trash sitting around the trash can. Or your use case could be focused directly on restrooms. And I wanna make sure I provide my passengers with the best restroom experience. So as an airport, you're, you're positioned in a way where you can go after the use case you want, find the sensors you want, and then pair that with a collaboration platform that's prepared to take all of that input and distribute it out to a workforce. And so no longer uh, are you required to do the one size fits all, follow that approach, where you need to marry a partner and say, look, I'm going with this partner for the full stack. They're gonna provide everything I need for janitorial. And if there are other pieces I need, I just need to pray, right, that my partner eventually evolves and moves into that space. Uh, with, with the Ubiquity APIs, it's very easy on the software engineering side to, um, to integrate with a sensor, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, the protocols on what data should be shared and what format they continue to standardize. So it's very easy for a software company to bring in that sensor data, make sense of it, and again, route it out to a distributed workforce. Final slide in closing, uh, just quick recap. We've got three trends, right, that, that uh, have emerged in cleaning that are taking us from that static and isolated type environment to a dynamic and collaborative environment. Uh, these trends are being driven by COVID-19. We no longer believe that these are gonna be optional. Airports will need to go in this direction. But the beauty of this movement is that it, it will change um, how airports look at cleaning, how they look at the digitization of cleaning, and a, a number of benefits are gonna accrue from that. So in closing, you know, obviously better cleaning, uh, an enhanced pasture experience. Uh, as we see here, the ACI study additional revenue, you know, that's a nice benefit, but that will come from cleaning, clearly lower operating costs. And then the final one, which is near and dear to our team at Springshot, and it's the leveling up of the workforce. And while robots are not uh, doing all the cleaning around the world today, uh, let's face it, it's inevitable. At some point, there will be more of a human robot partnership. And it's very important for us to accelerate and level up the janitorial uh, team members around the world so they get familiar with technology because in the future, it's not just going to be a mobile app. They will be deployed to interact with robots and make sure that the robots get the job done. Um, so that's it, guys. Uh, ex exciting times for us. It, it's terrible that it's COVID. Uh, like everything else uh, that we do, it's terrible. It's COVID that's, that's brought us here. But, um, but an interesting time in cleaning. And I appreciate, appreciate everyone's attention. So yeah, I'm willing back to you. Right, thanks, Doug. And um, no, I'm I'm really I'm really interested, uh, or, or I find it very interesting what you say. And and for example, this um, happy or not thing, uh, we we have it here in my home base in Frankfurt. And whenever I I go to the toilet or also after security control, they have it there. And it not only makes me feel that there is a better control but it also kind of gives me the feeling that I am kind of the, the, the participant to the better solution because only if I press one of these buttons, they will understand better how the current level of service is. So I think it also gives some power, but also some responsibility to the passenger. And that's why, why for, for me, for example, I really like this new technology because it just, makes it more visible and, and, and it helps you to actively change stuff. And I'll share, Jan, well, not only in the micro, are you helping every, all of your fellow passengers um, because there's an issue, right? If, if you don't hit the, the happy, there's an issue that's alerted and janitorial needs to come take action. You're helping crowdsource at a metadata level to let the airport know, and maybe the cleaners executed absolutely on protocol, but the protocol is wrong. Right, yeah. so this crowdsourcing of data that, that informs the airport that maybe we need to accelerate. It's not the janitor's fault. We need to build a better program. So you're absolutely right about that. Cool. 
Well, first of all, thanks a lot to, to everyone who just uh, shared their insights. We, we got quite some questions already. Um, I, I would like to start with a question from Anton Osthuizen. Um, it goes towards René. Um, does the additional uh, or enhanced processes really mean that the DNA will change? For me, the DNA is encoded into the core processes, for example, arrival and departure, and not in the uh, auxiliary processes that support the core. You're on mute. <laughs> okay, yep. maybe now you can hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much, yes. Um, Good question. Um, yeah, as we, as I indicated in in uh, in the slide of the uh, 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 new uh, process, is that the um, uh, the checks, the health checks, um, they are. It's very likely that some sort of health check is going to to stay around, uh, also for the longer term. Uh, so there will be some sort of certificate or some some check needs to be done and um, this will be an additional step in in uh, in in the airport process and and um, well I, we already uh, learned that for example security officials they are too busy with screening for security items so you cannot add it there so there needs to be an added step somewhere at the airport um, uh, that, for example, already is a, is a small change in the DNA. But we also think that because, because there are so many steps, and for example, for people that are flying the first time, or maybe elderly people, uh, going on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, uh, an air trip is, is quite an exciting uh, thing to do, because for them, it's really... Uh, it's really complicated. There's a lot of, there's a big sequence of steps. So we, we believe that this will also be a driver uh, in combination with all the available technologies, that this will be a driver that really will change uh, the DNA of the airport. And it doesn't mean that, that, that all the steps that are required now, that they are not being taken um, uh, because, because a boarding pass is, is needed, your passport check is needed, if you have a visa is needed, all these steps are required, but technology is facilitating that. And that's why the physical layout of an airport, uh, we believe uh, it's possible that this is going to change uh, in the near future. And if we look at the, uh, what, what the, the aviation industry is working on, uh, then I'm quite confident that, that uh, for the next uh, mid, to, mid to long term uh, future, this, this is really going to develop in, in, in such a direction. All right. Thanks, René. Thanks for the answer. Um, one more question, um, uh, Doc, for you from Alex Marti Martitrutsky. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that name. Um, do you see a certification requirement that airports need to prove they are compliant? Oh, Alex, very good question. Um, you know, I would say from uh, self-serving uh, self purposes that we, we would well, absolutely welcome that. Um, you know, I, I think that's critical uh, for passenger safety that that, that information um, that airports meet a certain standard, whether or not we see certification soon I think will depend largely on how long the pandemic lasts. I think what we're probably more likely to see, and we've seen it off airport in restaurants, for example, is that airports will mark it, right? If, if there's kind of standardization and a norm around uh, a certification, then it may not be required, but it could be marketed as an upsell that we meet certain standards. Um, so I, I think that that may be, you know, you may start to see that. You know, maybe much further down the line as we get standardization on you know, what cleaning programs should be followed. I think there's a lot of, you know, I think there's a lack of standardization around that around the world today, but I think it's things standardized, certainly from a data capture standpoint, the data is there to prove whether the work was done or not. Um, but I, th I think it'll take time before we get to a required type certification, but very, very good question. And we, uh, of course, we would love to see things go that route. Cool, thanks, Doug. And just uh, in between, uh, we, we started a, a small poll and um, as, 
in line with uh, today's webinar, it would be great if you also give us your feedback so that from our side, we can also advance for the, for the next and upcoming uh, webinars. Thanks. Going on with the questions, um, and Alex, I fully agree with you that um, uh, happy or not, they definitely need a touchless solution, especially in times like, like these. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one uh, question from uh, Anton Osthuizen, um, again, for uh, this time for all panelists. Um, Self-service and touchless tech is notorious for slowing down processes, especially in ATI, where a large percentage of packs are first-time flyers. Also, touchless AI must make use of pauses to ensure that movement were intentional. What is being done to mitigate this risk? I, I can uh, comment on that and uh, maybe uh, I'm not sure if that, I want that, to add. That was what I was hoping for. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, Anton. A uh, long time. Hope you're keeping well. Um, yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think it depends on, on the process. So, so some processes are slower using self-service and, and others are not. Uh, so check-in, for example, can be slower using a kiosk, but kiosks are cheap and uh, a human at a check-in desk is expensive. So you can just put in more check-in desks, for example, and, um, and speed up the process that way. In terms of, of touchless, again, what we found, and I'll answer your other question as well about the mobile phone, but in terms of touchless, what we found is for um, a straightforward touchless um, with a few questions and, and a simple enough interface, it's quite quick. Yes, it's a little slower than, uh, than touching a screen, uh, but the difference isn't significant. Um, and usually for, for fairly fast transactions, the, the delay really is getting up to the device and, uh, and going on to the next part of the journey. Um, if you look at maybe bag drop, for example, where you're dropping off the bag, doing the tagging process and so on, that's, that's a longer part of the process than, than interacting with the, with the screen as well, uh, for example. But I guess to, to your other question, which was, uh, why is there some resistance to using your mobile phone? What we do see is for, for more complex transactions on a touchless device, there will be a need to move to, a, uh, to the mobile phone. So already, as I said, I think there's going to be a strong move to check in. But if you could imagine, for example, if you, if you have to type in your name and address on a system using touchless and picking out all those, um, the characters on a, on a virtual keyboard, that would be quite tedious. Um, so we do see that kind of hybrid approach towards using your mobile phone for certain transactions, maybe even longer transactions, and certainly for payment. And then for the more straightforward transactions, the, the head movement detection is, is relatively quick. And I guess to answer your question about the, you know, why were some people resistant, I guess, to using their mobile phone, I think it comes down to a, to, to a hassle factor. Um, you know, for you to go up to the device, you have to go to the, pull up your mobile phone, you have to go to the app or to the web page and enter the information. It's as quick and easy just to walk up to the device and do the, the head movement detection and, and enter the answers in that way. What we had found was when there's a bit of a queue or a backlog for people to use the device and they're waiting to use it, then they might as well get their phone out and do that process in advance. So being in front of the, in front of the kiosk is quicker. But if there's no one in the queue, then they just go ahead and, uh, and don't bother using the mobile phone. All right, thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, one more question for you, Rene, uh, from uh, Wulan Fisser. Uh, thanks, Rene, for the very clear overview graphics. Um, what, according to you, are the biometric technology solutions with the highest potential to adapt airports to new and anticipated ICAO health guidelines? Uh, thank you for the question. Good question. Um, uh, for for the well, as a basis, I think um, a biometric, uh, the the adoption of biometrics, and then in particular uh, facial biometrics, uh, where what airports are are trialing with now and implementing now, I think as a basis is already a a. A rather uh, health conscious uh, solution, uh, of course, because um, a checkpoint uh, with biometrics works from a distance and you don't need to have uh, any interaction with, uh, with uh, airport staff. So uh, from that sense, uh, a biometric solution is already a very good uh, step uh, to having a, a health and, and, and clean environment. And on top of that, 
um, as I mentioned before, if you have a, a managed uh, uh, self-sovereign identity, you know, if you, if you have, if you can control your own uh, um, ID, uh, include uh, that includes your your biometrics, um, but you can also uh, it, it can also include your, uh, for example, your vaccinations and uh, your entire record of your vaccinations. Then you could also process this. Uh, you could forward this to the airport, which will also, uh, or the airport, or the airport stakeholder, this the stakeholder in, in your trip that needs to check this. Then you can. Uh, you will also have a better uh, um, uh, uh, status uh, of your healthiness, and and you know that all the people that are are going into a flight. Uh, all uh, have been uh, vaccinated or, or, or don't have any disease, uh, uh, they're not, not carrying any diseases. So, so in that sense, uh, it will be a, 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 a good solution. All right. Thanks, Rene. You can directly stay on. <laughs> uh, there is one more question from uh, Miguel Sanchez Jimenez. Um, first of all, thank you all for this interesting webinar. The question is, which are the mid-term and long-term benefits for moving the baggage handling system, system about of the terminal building? How to move the on-site checked baggage there? Yeah, that's, that's part of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the package to, re, to redesign the, the, the check-in. If you uh, move away uh, bags out of the departure hall, of course, it clears up space uh, over there. And this is more on the longer term. Um, and it can, uh, you can have, uh, for example, a baggage factory. It's, it's uh, of course, it's on the site and it's close to a terminal building. Um, uh, but it, it's separate from, from the, the terminal layout. Normally, um, a a baggage handling system below uh, or, or in, a, in a design of a terminal building is, is rather um, obstructing uh, many possibilities in your building. Uh, for example, if you, have, if you need expansion, it's very important that, that uh, expansion is taken, taken into account in your, in your terminal building. And if, if, it's, if, if, if it's not taken into account, then it's often very difficult to add an additional check-in line or, or anything uh, inside your terminal building. So expansion could also take place, for example, outside the terminal building in a, a baggage facility that's, that's on-site, but, but uh, remote from, from the terminal. So it's kind of a, it's more a development uh, solution than, than a, uh, a, a COVID solution. But we, we think this could be uh, uh, a development that happens more often in the future and, and may, might change, uh, be a small change in the DNA of an airport. Uh. Yeah, I understood. Um, last but not least, uh, one more question from Alex uh, for you, Rene. Um, on slide 11, you, you mentioned biometric and, and, and biometric passports. Uh, who maintains or governs the individual data? What security measures are taking place? Um, yeah, that uh, question is, is posed to me. It, um, of course, this, this is depending on the solution, uh, where you are in the world. Um, in, the, in the US, uh, it's, it's different there. It's, it's managed by the TSA, uh, your biometric data. Um, and in other places, uh, it, it really depends. So for example, in, in uh, seamless flow or one ID solution, very often the airport uh, themselves are keeping the data for a certain amount of time, maybe 24 hours or something. And after that, it will be deleted. Um, it all depends on the, on the consent. Uh, mostly if, if, the, if, the, if the system is designed properly, uh, according to, for example, uh, privacy by design, then uh, uh, the consent will be, will be requested to the passenger for, for each use of his data. So in a passenger trip, if you have like five steps to do, passport check and uh, boarding and presenting your boarding card, every step your consent will be, will be requested. And if you give consent, then, then um, uh, it, it's, it's, um, your, your data privacy is guaranteed. 
Um, so, so the solutions are different. One, sometimes it's stored at an airport, uh, and, and in some uh, occasions. And for the for the future solutions, that's something that's being worked on. Uh, and uh, the ICAO is working on the digital travel credentials, and that's quite a promising solution. And then uh, this works with with uh, probably is going to work with a blockchain. Uh, and then uh, you are managing your own data, and your data is distributed over a. Um, I know you keep your data, but the key to the data is distributed over the nodes of a blockchain. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be a very secure solution. And this, but this is very uh, premature state uh, status now. But but I believe that that uh, potentially is a good uh, a technology that's very promising for the future. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, there are two more questions. So I would say, um, keeping the time in, in mind, um, I will, I will uh, have one more question from Piotr uh, Krajewski. Uh, for the other one, um, this will, will definitely be also answered, uh, but I guess, Rene, you will get back to, to know uh, via email or via the in-house in chat. Okay, thanks. Um, so the, the question from Piotr is, uh, biometric single points seem very interesting solution. As they are presented by NACO, they provide an extra space gained for a benefit of other functions for AirSight. However, this is a um, uh, OND scenario as presented on the slide. What about hub and transfer flows? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, indeed. Uh, for hub and transfer flows, you would you would require um, uh, there there different opportunities. Um, if the world around us is going to adopt uh, the biometric uh, identity uh, and airports uh, are going to share, for example, uh, uh, the data of the passenger, then upon arrival. Or, or upon a, a transfer uh, location, that data could be used for the trip. Um, it's also you could also think about uh, airlines or or uh, um, uh, uh, groups like SkyTeam or something that that they share and eh, that they have uh, common platforms that can share this kind of uh, data. Uh, and otherwise, indeed, um, people would have to enroll uh, upon uh, arrival at an airport or should enroll separately on a program or still have to go through the traditional process. So there will, there will be also a, uh, a, a, a period of time, or maybe it will always remain, that people are able to opt out of the procedure and still go through the traditional way of, uh, of processing. All right. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot, René. Um, you really uh, spurred some, some interest from the crowd. Um, but also Bob, Doug, great contributions. Um, it was very interesting to also see your experience in Australia with the, with the mobile phone and, and the, and the um, uh, head movements. Uh, and Doug, honestly, I think I've never thought about cleaning in an airport as much as I did this afternoon. <laughs> so so I, I will look at it differently next time I'm at an airport. Thanks a lot for this. Thanks everyone who participated or who, who joined us today for this webinar. Um, you can see the, the contact details of everyone uh, on this slide. So again, if you have further questions, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to, to contact them. Um, we will cut this video into several pieces uh, for René, Bob and Doug so that you can then later on also have uh, the specific videos um, and we will share the links uh, during probably tomorrow latest on, on Friday with you. So with that, um, again, thanks a lot. Have a nice rest of your day um, from wherever you, you watch us today. And looking forward to see you again during our next webinar. Bye bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.